Good morning. Today, the Sunday of the prodigal son. We've gone over this over and over again every year, and we all know who the prodigal sons are, right? Do you know any? Yes, yes. We're all prodigal sons, and there is nothing we can do to escape from it. So it's easy to talk about the prodigal son because we all understand it. It's very obvious to us because we all know that we sin. We all know that we have moved away from God many times. I mean, it's rare that anybody will actually never sin. It's possible with the grace of God, but it's quite rare. Even the greatest of the saints talk about how sinful they are. And we know that they are not really committing sins like we do, but they still say that they are sinful. Because even their thoughts can be sinful. Even our thoughts. And I'll get back to that because that's very critical and very important. So today, instead of talking about the prodigal son, I will talk about his brother who has not sinned, or he thinks he hasn't sinned. Okay, he did not, the prodigal son, who seems to be the younger one, has gone out there with the wealth of his father and spent it in um, loose living. And as the brother says, he spent it with prostitutes and all kinds of other things that the older brother did not do. The older brother remained at home. He was faithful to his father. He worked diligently. He did not transgress any laws, any rules. He was faithful to the father. He was there all the time. But the younger one spent half of the, um, half of the, whatever the father had and gave him. And then he had nothing. So the prodigal son comes back and the brother, of course, the father has given a party, has thrown a party because his son was dead and he's alive again and he's lost and he has been found. So the father is very happy. He embraces him, he kisses him, he welcomes him. And I want to repeat one more time that that is an image of the father of God the Father that Jesus is giving us. So this concept that God is ready to destroy us and, and he hates us and that he is angry at us, that is not the image of the Father that Jesus gives us. The image of the Father that, gives us, that Jesus gives us is a father who is waiting for his son anxiously to return. And when he comes and he sees him, he embraces him and he kisses him and he has him washed, he gives him new clothes, he gives him a ring on his right hand so that he can denote that he's free and then throws a party. He kills the best calf that he has and then they eat and drink and they're happy. But the older son he comes back and he hears, listen to this now, the details are important. He hears there is some sort of festive music or uh, voices, whatever, in the house. He does not enter the house. He calls one of the servants and he asks, he says, what's going on? And the servant says, oh, your brother has returned and your father has thrown a party. And what is the reaction of this brother? What's the reaction? He is angry. He's angry. Instead of being happy that his brother has returned, he doesn't even know if his brother was alive. This is the first time that he's going to see him. He knows that his brother has spent whatever the father gave him, half of what the father had. But this brother, instead of being happy that his brother has returned, 
he was angry and refused to go into the house. And his father has to come out and entreat him. But he answered to the father, Lord, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a kid to party with my friends. But when you, this son of yours, this son of yours returns, who has devoured, devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. This is very interesting to me. Not that only he's jealous, but that he's angry. Why would he be angry? Think about it. Why is, he, why is he angry? I mean, you would think he would rejoice, right? You would think that at least he would say, ah, okay, the prodigal has returned. Let's go make fun of him. <laughs> you would think that, um, I don't know what else. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have done. Perhaps I would have gone in and made fun of him, really. But he's angry. What made him angry? What do you think made him angry? Pride. Pride about the fact that he was perfect. Pride because he did not transgress any of the rules. He never went with harlots. He never wasted money. He was always diligent about the work every day. He went to work and came back went to work and came back. He didn't even ask for a small kid, a goat or a, 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 bo a sheep, a, a lamb, for himself. He never did because he understood that whatever, this is not proper. That's how he had in his head. But what made him angry the most is that all this time that his brother was gone, he festered in his mind some thoughts. They were thoughts that were cultivated. They were thoughts that were brewing in his head. They were thoughts that were negative. They were thoughts that were judgmental about his brother. They were thoughts that were prideful and self-righteous about himself. They were thoughts that eventually exploded into anger when the brother comes back and his father received him. He wants his brother to be punished. He wants his brother to be thrown out of the house for whatever he did. He wants his brother to be um, rejected. He does not forgive his brother. The father has forgiven him. He has received him. He has accepted him. But he is not forgiving his brother. So there is resentment for what the brother did, or what the younger brother did, there is um, unforgiveness, wanting punishment for him, and there is plenty of pride that has been brewing in his heart. And the thoughts in his head grow from all of those things to become anger. That is very common to people. Very common among us. I don't know if you ever experienced that. Have you ever experienced that? Very common. When you think that you're better, when you think that you're perfect, when you think that you're always doing the right thing, when everybody around you praises you that you're so good, then thoughts work in your mind. And you know, I was very impressed. Yesterday I went to bless somebody's home. I'm not going to say who. And I walked into one of the rooms, the study, I think it was, and there was the wall. The mother of the family had written these things. Watch your thoughts. This is for the children, but also for everybody, I suppose, right? Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. I stood in front of that 
I couldn't help it. I took my phone out and I took a picture. I printed it this morning to have it with me. This is absolutely beautiful. There is a little book that we used in our spiritual book club called Your Thoughts Determine Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. It's written by a Serbian priest who is a holy man. He's, a, uh, he's considered a holy man in Serbia. I think he passed away recently. We have it in the bookstore. You can get it and listen to it and, and, and read it and listen to his words. He, th he says that our thoughts, as we harbor them, as we ponder on them, our thoughts will determine our lives. And this is very, of course, this explains the stages of how that happens. I'll share it with anybody who wants to use it. You can also write it on the walls in your house to see it every day and remember it, and for the children to see it and remember it. But um, in this book, the priest explains in detail the different aspects, just like here. These are the steps. He goes deeper into every step and explains how our thoughts will lead us into whatever we're doing. If our thoughts are negative, if our thoughts are judgmental, if our thoughts are prideful, if our thoughts are condemning of others and jealous of others, those thoughts would determine our actions in the end and would determine the outcome of our lives. But if our thoughts are positive, if our thoughts are forgiving, if our thoughts are not judgmental, and if we think of ourselves as a sinner, even though we know that the other has sinned as well, then we'll receive forgiveness, we will have peace, we will have a better life, a spiritual life that is better than anything else. If there is anything to learn from this parable, it's not about the others, it's about ourselves. Whether we belong in one category or the other, whether we are the prodigal son or the brother who was perfect, who remained home, it is for us. And sometimes we are the prodigal and sometimes we are the judgmental brother. And that is what determines our lives. Amen.